Uh, Honorable Madam Minister Hartmann, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, it is an honor for me to address uh, this conference. Uh, in fact, my predecessors, as well as uh, members of my staff, have had the pleasure to uh, participate, to, to contribute in this annual uh, very significant event. It was in the past. For me, today is the first opportunity. And that's why I am so grateful for this kind invitation which I received on behalf of the distinguished organizers, the Integration Foundation, the Ministry of Culture of Estonia. And uh, this speaks uh, to the, such a close collaboration and partnership between Estonia and my office of the High Commissioner on National Minorities of the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe. And this partnership, and literally, friendship uh, has been continuing since 30 years ago when this very office was established. Indeed, Estonia's long-standing experience in integration policies has evolved in parallel with the work of my institution. Estonia marked its 30th anniversary in integration work last year. In 2023, we will also celebrate 30th years since the Office of the High Commission on National Minorities was established in The Hague. Uh, this represents an opportunity to reflect how the world has changed in the past 30 years, highlight the relevance of the mandate of High Commissioner, and share the lessons that we have learned from engaging with participating states, and namely with Estonia. And the geopolitical challenges, and Madam Minister has reflected just a few moments ago on them, um, those challenges that we are all facing with the moment of such an unprecedented, not simply challenges, but also threats to our security and sometimes even to our physical safety, and we will have opportunity to talk about it uh, later today. My uh, mandate uh, was established 30 years ago. At that time, it was still a conference, not organization, but conference on security and cooperation in Europe. And uh, is this kind of mandate, and probably you remember the name of the, of the first High Commission on National Minorities, Honorable Max van der Stuhl, the uh, uh, Dutch, renowned Dutch statesman. Uh, so this mandate uh, is to provide so-called early warning and early action to prevent tensions involving national minorities issues from developing these tensions into the conflict. I engage in quiet diplomacy and with discrete actions I am providing tailored expertise to the 57 OEC participating states in order to support their efforts to develop and implement policies that facilitate the integration of diverse societies. At a time when the degree of both real and perceived diversity in our societies has increased, promoting policies and laws that facilitate Integration through inclusion and respect for diversity is one of the most effective tools to prevent conflicts. Unfortunately, during the time my office has been operational, tensions related to national minority issues have not ceased to be relevant factors in conflict and war. Rather, confrontation prevails across OEC region. The inability to manage diversity in society and to meet the rights and needs of minorities, whether these are traditional minorities or new arrivals as immigrants or refugees, is exacerbated by inflammatory and populistic rhetoric. And I observe it with deep 
frustration still in many corners of the OECE uh, region. Often minorities are presented as a national security threat in political discourse. Achieving a balance between protecting the sovereignty and territorial integrity of states on the one hand and preserving the specific identity of minorities on the other hand appears increasingly difficult, especially for relatively young states that are still undergoing national building process. Against this backdrop, the practice of politicizing, sometimes even weaponizing minorities abroad who are sometimes used by their so-called kin states as proxies in local crises or conflicts has become a concerning trend. In line with my institution's Bolzan and Bozen recommendations on national minorities in interstate relations, I hold that states may have a legitimate interest to support persons belonging to national minorities residing in other states based on ethnic, cultural, linguistic, uh, religious, historical, or any other ties. However, there is a risk that this legitimate support could infringe on the sovereignty and territorial integrity of the country, and not only territorial integrity, where the minorities reside. This is the key message of these recommendations, which try to help states support minorities abroad in a manner that respects good neighborly relations. These recommendations aim to help states avoid the risk that minority issues are manipulated and instrumentalized for political reasons, which can undermine the legitimate role of the state and even lead to cross-border conflict. This is, as we have unfortunately seen, a realistic scenario. Alerting participating states to the dangers associated with this practice is something that I have been focusing on since uh, talking up took my mandate, we are already seeing the devastating consequences of the Russian Federation's decision to invade Ukraine and most recently its illegal annexation of Ukraine's sovereign territories. As I have shared through my channels of above-mentioned quiet diplomacy, continued violence, aggression and the forcible redrawing of boundaries with a stated objective to protect minorities or to build homogeneous societies will only lead to the further catastrophe. And it applies not to the only to the ongoing war, but uh, to some other possible scenarios uh, in our OEC area. Ladies and gentlemen, in light of these risks, that what can we do to increase the resilience of our diverse societies to crisis, external instrumentalization and conflict? Over the years, my office has developed a set of guidelines and recommendations to, in a number of policy areas, such as education, the use of language, uh, role of law, policing, media, participation of minorities, as well as in, with regard to interstate relations. These guidelines aim to help the 57 OEC participating states to strengthen integration and resilience of their societies. Just some weeks ago, my office marked the 10th anniversary of the Ljubljana uh, guidelines on the integration of diverse societies, uh, one of the most comprehensive thematic publication of the HCNM. These Ljubljana guidelines state that integration is a dynamic multi-actor process of mutual engagement that facilitates effective participation by all members of a diverse society in the economic, political, social and cultural life and foster the shared and inclusive sense of belonging at national and local level. End of quotation. There are two key components here. Mutual engagement leading to an outcome which is shared and inclusive sense of belonging rather than putting the stress on how minorities might be accommodated within a nation-building project. There is an explicit focus on mutual engagement. 
In this sense, integration is defined as a two-way process that entails that both the majority and minority communities take responsibility for accommodating the needs of all and share the benefit of it. The Ljubljana guidelines also argue that this mutual accommodation can lead to change in minority and majority cultures. This may be an uncomfortable concept for those who are primarily interested in promoting and safeguarding one singular uniform identity. Such aspiration is not only undesirable, but also unrealistic. As the first High Commissioner, I mentioned his name, Max van der Stuhl, said, diversity is a matter of fact, and it is here to stay. That said, we need to acknowledge that minority communities are never homogeneous groups, and specific uh, groups within them may have their own particular needs. Challenges to foster the participation of minority women often facing intersectional discrimination are a case in point. Then the Ljubljana guidelines very well explain there has to be an understanding that identity is fluid, multi-layered, multiple, sometimes shifting concept, and that elements of the identity of what are considered to be different groups often intersect and overlaps. As one speaker at our Ljubljana Guidelines Anniversary Conference uh, recently put, we no longer live in a layered cake where groups are separate and stuck. We live in a marble cake where different butters have flowed into one another. This reinforces the need to focus on the integration of societies as opposed to um, integration into society and on policies that affect the whole of it and not only minority communities. Estonia's comprehensive integration strategy, which brings together sectorial policies affecting the whole of society, is a tangible example of how this can be done in practice. Uh, related uh, monitoring mechanisms add an essential element of accountability. This is how change is most effectively achieved. But going back to inclusive policies that strengthen the cohesion of society, what are we talking about concretely? The policies that my office promotes are based on the principle of balance. Balance between the legitimate interest of the state to promote its national identity through language, education, historic memory, the media, to name but a few relevant policy areas, and the right of national minorities to see their own identity preserved and their interests and aspirations met. There are no one-size-fits-all ready-made solutions. Solutions are contextual. That is why in our joint work with participating states, my office closely cooperates within, with policymakers, practitioners and members of the community, and I am so glad to see among participants of this conference our long-standing and reliable partners uh, from academia, uh, and from think tanks, and from such a vibrant uh, civil society. One policy area that we regularly see emerging as most central when talking about integration is education. In particular, multilingual education, which my institution has been promoting and concretely supporting for decades, has borne promising results in terms of social cohesion. In most of the context in which I operate, we help policymakers to maintain a balance between protecting the mother tongue of minorities and the need for minorities to be fluent in the state language in order for them to be fully engaged in public life and realize their full potential in society. But make no mistake, it is not just about language and it is not just about policies related to school 
catering for children with minority background. The process of mutual accommodation that I was referring to earlier implies a change in the education system so that mutual understanding and interactions are strengthened in programs targeting the majority communities uh, as well. Estonia has a wealth of experience to showcase in multilingual education, which my office has often referred to as a source of inspiration to other countries. One aspect that the Ljubljana guidelines also addresses and that I am aware some speakers after me will also discuss today in the, is the issue of, as it was also mentioned in the introductory statements, issue of segregation, including in education. The guidelines acknowledge that as some minority rights are meaningful only when exercised in community with others, this may result in a degree of distinction from other groups in society in certain contexts. The guidelines advise that because isolation or excessive separation may weaken cross-community links and undermine the cohesiveness of society, it should therefore be counted or mitigated through a additive approach. In this regard, I recall a heartwarming story from Bosnia and Herzegovina. Every two years, my institution, on behalf of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of the Netherlands, presents the Max van der Stuhl Award in honor of the first High Commissioner. Did, who are awarded? We are talking about individual, group or organizations for their outstanding achievements in improving the position of national minorities. In 2018, the prize went to an informal group of students from the town of Yaitse in Bosnia and Herzegovina for their inspiring and courageous opposition to ethnic segregation in school. Throughout 2016, they vigorously campaigned against the decision by the education authorities to separate students based on ethnocentric curricula in line with the so-called two school under one roof model prevalent in the country. Practices such as the persistently reinforced ethnic division and they rooted in the structural legacies of the armed conflict of 30 years ago, which played out in that region as well as the subsequent constitutional framework led out in the Dayton Peace Agreement. In the immediate post-war period, specific measures were necessary compromise to avoid a relapse into conflict. However, decades later, this is no longer needed. The students of Yaitse understood that and took actions to reverse a situation that only serves to cement diversity in society. They advocated for and managed to achieve, in fact, an approach that takes into account the difference and sensitivities surrounding the school curricula, while firmly rejecting classroom segregation. This youth-driven grassroots initiative, which used the motto, segregation is a bad investment, perfectly reflects the values of integration and inclusion that I and my office advocate. This is very relevant to other countries and contexts as well. I hope you agree, even in current uh, dramatic circumstances. Since February, I've been telling participating states that, it, it, that in response to today's war, conflict and national security challenges, it is important that we do not further marginalize minorities. Education in minority language just should not be stifled, stifled, but strengthened and given proper resources to promote mastery of official languages. I advise against banning the use of minority language in public space. Rather, multilingualism, wherever appropriate, should be cherished and promoted and resources and incentives for learning and using the official language should be made available to all. Closing minority media channels 
could be perceived as a security necessity, but opportunities to access domestically produced content in minority languages should then be offered. Controversial monuments do not have to be destroyed. They could be used as an opportunity to learn from the past. Efforts to fight hate speech and hate crime, including against minorities, should continue and be adequately communicated to the public. And indeed, segregation should be avoided in all spheres of life and mutual contacts should be promoted. Overcoming the current um, geopolitical divisions is an overwhelming challenge. At the same time, many minority issues with conflict potential have concrete and sometimes technical level answers. From my work and the work of my predecessors with the 57 uh, participants of the OEC over the past three decades, I have drawn lessons, examples, inspiration. Estonia and its experience in integration policies has helped us enrich the toolbox that I share with participating states facing integration challenges. The international community, including the OEC, through its institutions, mechanisms and policies, has an important role to play. My mandate to prevent, con to prevent conflict with regard to national minority issues is well placed to identify and early um, signs of conflict and propose strategies to prevent it both in the short and long term. And I'm taking this splendid opportunity to express my sincere appreciation to above-mentioned OEC participating states, to their governments, for their openness, for their constructiveness. In fact, my um, uh, practical work proved that uh, I do not have any kind of issues, problems in, in interaction with governments, with decision makers, with respect, uh, distinguished members of the parliaments, at the same time, my another observation is that many countries uh, have managed to adopt almost perfect legislation when it comes to the interests of national minorities in all above mentioned areas of education, language, language and linguistic policies of participation of national minorities in political, cultural, economic life, but at the same time, what deserved much more attention today is implementation. And uh, this, my uh, visit is going to be uh, one of the first of my interactions with the Estonian, uh, my Estonian new friends and interlocutors in the government in particular. I am going to deliver some messages, some of my above mentioned guidelines and recommendations to the kind attention of this decision makers, I received quite a bulk of significant um, uh, ideas and initiatives as well as, well as uh, concerns expressed by the representatives of ethnic national communities during my yesterday's interaction in Narva. Many thanks, Dmitry, for organizing my meeting there, uh, in particular with roundtable uh, but, but, uh, p p participants. I visited already, I've, uh, within this day, I've already visited a couple of your education entities, uh, teachers, as well as students also expressing some kind of their concerns, which are also aimed to integration of diverse um, Estonian society, as well as uh, aimed at improving, um, well, conditions for their staying here. In particular, I can tell you that some of um, the proposals are about, about um, how to preserve uh, some level of education in mother tongue, in particular in Russian language. Some students raising in issues of uh, extension of their residential permits after graduating the renowned uh, Estonian education entities. Uh, but sometimes, and I am sad to admit, our children, students, they facing the consequences of geopolitics. 
So geopolitics, I'm set to admit, playing a role today, even in the fate and destiny of the, not only of languages or education or other systems, but also in the destiny of individuals, of our youth. And I didn't, uh, I, uh, I'm not, a, don't want to take up too much of uh, our very valuable time. I didn't reflect extensively on gender-related issues, women, and in, in particular, girls are becoming so vulnerable today in light of um, above mentioned and many other ch challenges. So with this, uh, let me to express my hope that today's event will serve as a sort of catalyst for us not only to reflect on and learn from the past, but also to recognize that respecting and effectively governing diversity within one society is vital for our future. For we have far more in common that unites us than divides us. Thank you for your attention. Большое спасибо за внимание. Thank you very much. Now we have a bit time for, for questions and answers. Is there anyone in the audience who would like to uh, who would like to say something, ask something? Um, if not, then actually we, we have some 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 minutes left. Uh, you said that. Uh, uh, you, you also wanted to elaborate a bit on, on gender issues. Actually, you know, we have a few minutes. If, if you have something you, you would like to add in this, then this is the time now. Uh, well, uh, our organization for security and cooperation and, uh, in Europe, uh, as well as other uh, international entities, in particular United Nations funds, agencies and programs, Council of Europe, um, uh, as well as some regional and sub-regional organizations, uh, putting quite, you know, in very prominent and priority, you know, place issues related to gender equality and uh, 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 women, women's and girls' rights. Uh, even more, my office is, going, is working now on uh, all kind of uh, research in order to, to uh, concentrate attention of OEC participating states on intersectionality uh, or with regard to gender uh, balance in our uh, activity. Uh, what is important to note is that, um, well, I, we want to avoid a situation when uh, too many cooks spoiling the broth. On the contrary, I am so glad to um, admit that all above mentioned actors today as united as never before when it comes to addressing gender issues. In particular, we are going to organize a series of various kinds of events in, in the framework of all these for us. On the other side, gender is uh, an issue which in fact highlighted in national strategies of many countries. I'm here, for example, when it comes to just one particular segment, when it comes to gender equality and promotion of rights of women, I'm visiting Estonia. Before I was in Lithuania, and I was so positively impressed by the number of uh, women uh, present in the, the above-mentioned decision bodies in the governments, in parliaments, such a per almost perfect gender balance. On other side, on other side, I know that how it is important for uh, national minorities, in particular, also to be also part of this our mainstream uh, policies uh, with regard to gender equality. And for, from this perspective, I'm, uh, for example, uh, so glad to share with you that uh, in my own country, in Kazakhstan, in particular, uh, by constitutional law, we reserving one third of the seats in elected bodies, also in party and other lists, for women and youth. So one third of seats to be reserved for this very important group of uh, our population. So I take this opportunity and to, to, to thinking about also maybe it, it is time also to reserve some quota for representatives of minorities 
and among them women to be in a prominent place. Oh, okay, yeah, let's start from there and then, then, then the next person. Yeah, Palun. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation. Um, uh, my name is Bart Kozijn. I moved this summer with my Dutch Estonian family from the Netherlands to Estonia. Cool. So I'm here to integrate and very happy to be part of this conference. Uh, you were talking about the war in Ukraine and all the terrible uh, situation we are in. Uh, I'm wondering, like, how do you observe that the war also kind of challenges and speeds up uh, processes of integration and, and let's say, the, um, the awareness in European societies about the importance of integration, integrating minorities, uh, also like developments in this part of Europe. So I'm curious, how do you see the, like the, the war affecting our consciousness of, of the position of minorities in European societies? Well, this is quite a complex uh, you know, issue, and thank you for this question. I will just link it also maybe with pre previous one. Uh, I, I didn't mention to you that both in uh, Lithuania as well as here in Estonia, I was very impressed by dedication, generosity, and commitment of your, not only of your governments, but also of ordinary people providing such an enormous support to refugees coming from Ukraine. And I watched some even TV reports on Estonian TV, when, uh, and among them, most of them are women. And I watched some reports how, you know, here in this society, opportunities also provided for integrating of women and of their child's children, to the, not only to education system, also, but also to uh, uh, labor, to labor market. Indeed, indeed, this is, this is a perfect opportunity now for all of us to readdress issues which I just highlighted in brief before. So, uh, uh, what we should do is to prevent any possibility in the future of instrumentalizing, of instrumentalization and politicization of issues related to interests of minorities. Also, in my statement, I mentioned about new uh, migrants new minorities which are arriving to our societies and most probably, uh, you know, even from demographic, linguistic, cultural perspectives, some societies are going to face some dramatic changes in coming uh, years and uh, decades. So that's why for the government it's so important and again I am offering with all my uh, not in this particular case generosity but uh, I am consistently inviting governments, please address meticulously, point by point, issue by issue, issues related to the interests of minorities, in this particular case of those who are coming also from the warfare zones. And by the way, uh, I was also quite impressed how uh, governments here in the region managed to, probably I should also, of course, to, to, to add Latvia, I didn't visit it during this tour, how these uh, governments try, are flexible enough in order to, you know, to accommodate the needs of uh, children and their parents when it comes, for example, to uh, hire and to, to find teachers. By the way, this issue of teachers is also important for Estonia itself, because if now this society is shifting to the, you know, uh, state language, just purely state language, language education, it is so important to find uh, teachers to, uh, for in, uh, to, to teach in Estonian language, at the same time not to lose the pat uh, capacity of the past. Of the, because, for example, in particular case, and this is a question which I am receiving very often about the destiny of the Russian language. If Russian language or Russian culture or Russian-speaking people not to be a sort of you know, collateral damage of all above-mentioned geopolitics, please do continue investing into the languages. For example, in this particular... By the way, in case of Estonia, Lithuania and Latvia, these three nations are among most, you know, um, successful when it comes to cooperation with my part of the world, with Central Asia. And just guess why? What is the, you know, comparative um, advantage which Estonia has comparing to Finland, for example? Both nations are quite, you know, 
prosperous enough, but at the same time, Estonia has much more advantages because your entrepreneurs, your business community, your academics, your um, experts um, coming to our region and speaking in the same language with their compatriots, with their colleagues in my particular country, especially the country of Kazakhstan, in particular during pandemic, for example. Doctors, medical doctors of Estonia and of Kazakhstan established direct uh, Zoom, well, Zoom, right? Zoom, Zoom kind of uh, assisting each other. Uh, on the other hand, these days, for example, uh, 53 headmasters probably of schools of, from Kazakhstan visiting, namely Estonia, to learn, to learn from your education system. Probably one of the area will be how to shift from, um, uh, you know, uh, how to make sure that state language will be, you know, so much demanded by population of my country in uh, particular. So you have no right to commit any mistake. You, are, you, know, you should lead by example. Estonia and uh, the rest of the OEC community, especially in light of all above mentioned. And please, as we, when it comes to the Russian language, it is so sophisticated, it is so rich. Uh, if we will lose Today, any you know single our uh, you know knowledge of its grammar, it will be you know it will have quite a uh, effect uh, for the future. But uh, uh, again, Estonia is one of those places which could be con considered as a sort of in our former language as a po polygon of friendship. Uh, but at the same time, implementation is so important. Uh, and uh, I just mentioning this country because I stay here, but there are many other areas which still have to do a lot in order to reach the level of their uh, policies which uh, protect and engage into their policies the interests of minorities, including new minorities which are arriving. And we had one more question, please. Yes. Uh, does it work? Yes, it yeah, works. It works. Um, thank you very much, Your Excellency, for a very interesting keynote speech. Um, my name is Olga Sitnik. I'm working in the Ministry of Culture of Estonia. And um, I would like to go back again to this uh, the first question we, you, we had. Uh, uh, so you, you already mentioned this intersectional uh, approach um, uh, to dealing with, with minorities. I would like to ask about another big minority. We have LGBTQ plus uh, people. How do you have any kind of special um, measures how to support these people within the national minority uh, groups, right? Because we know that they are especially vulnerable uh, in some places of the world still. Uh, if you are a national minority and if you're gay, you can have very big problems. So do you have any kind of a special approach and, and recommendations regarding that? Thank you. Well, in fact, our organization is also dealing with this and many other issues. So I, take, I will not take up too much time, as I mentioned, because uh, this is maybe a matter for our future uh, researchers, and we will engage our above-mentioned experts into that. The members of my staff are here, so we will uh, address this issue in our internal meetings, but so far I cannot reflect widely on this issue now. Okay, do we have any other? Yeah, okay, there is also a hand raised. We have some time left, some seconds left, so... Mark yeah, Ranot, uh, Estonian Institute of Human Rights. May I inquire about uh, the positive experience uh, in Kazakhstan uh, concerning uh, learning the state language? Uh, I recall when I uh, visited uh, first Kazakhstan, the city of Guryev. There I couldn't find uh, any Russian speaking a word in Kazakh. And uh, during the last uh, visit uh, some years ago, I found out that uh, most of um, the youth speak uh, uh, Kazakh language quite well. Even uh, uh, those whose um, uh, domestic language uh, was Russian. Uh, how could you reach uh, such a miracle? What might be, have been the core element in such policy? 
Well, it, it will take another session, or even two, to <laughs> discuss, and I am so glad that there are some, in, uh, in audience we have some experts, those who really did cont contributed a lot into, for Kazakhstan's for elaborating Kazakhstan policies with regard to promoting state language, but not by the expense of other languages in my country. So, political will. Political, well, number one is the political will of our leadership. So probably this was a key factor which promoted such a balanced approach. When I'm so thankful for your observation, I am also so glad to learn about it, that now state language, the Kazakh uh, language, you know, occupying very prominent place, not only in our constitution, but also in our daily Life. And this is a, you know, a result of steadfast policy which has been delivered by political leadership with the support of all this multi-ethnic and multi-confessional society, developing mechanisms for political consultations between government, parliament and national minorities, in particular, well, Assembly of People of Kazakhstan, which has even a quota, and that's why, by the way, I mentioned to you about, you know, quota not only for gender, for women and youth, but also maybe for the minorities. So providing quota for representatives of national minorities in the parliament. By the way, one of the uh, highlights of my recent trips was uh, the following one. Uh, visiting one of Central Asian states, uh, I met representatives of national communities, uh, or in this current language, national minorities there. And what was the, my take out from these meetings was the message which I received on their behalf. These representatives of national communities told, uh, telling me, until recently, we've been demanded only in two occasions. One is National Day celebration, and the second one, the celebration of Navruz, you know, this our oriental um, uh, holiday in my uh, uh, part uh, of the world. So all these communities have been engaged only in these two occasions, just formally to present their singing, dancing, presenting their national costumes, etc. And that's it, two times a year, or during some other, you know, festivities. Now, representatives of national communities assuring me that they are offering themselves their services, their knowledge, their wisdom to authorities engaged into these above-mentioned consultations, into various kind of, you know, uh, events which organized here. And by the way, in Estonia, I, will, I already was, uh, you know, observing many um, these adv adv advertisements of some various kind of national festivals you are organizing here, including film festival, uh, cultural festivals uh, in the uh, field of literature, etc., etc. So, the um, uh, remedy, the re recipe to reach the same low level of peaceful coexistence of so many ethnicities and religious Confessions is, of course, the political will of elected people, establishment of meaningful mechanisms for political consultations. All any law which is going to pass through the parliament should be thoroughly discussed with representatives of minorities, in, in particular, and of course uh, the well uh, responsibility. Uh, of, on behalf of uh, those who are uh, you know, responsible for uh, delivering these policies of inter-ethnic relations. But again, I'm so thankful for your observation. Uh, by the way, one of the factors which also Central Asia is now, uh, projects which we are developing is, uh, my office in Central Asia, is so-called uh, multi, uh, multilingual mother tongue based education multilingual multicultural mother tongue based education uh, in some of central asian republics including in kazakhstan in, in particular and no one left behind in such a situation representatives of any of 130 ethnicities living in my country 
feeling themselves very comfortably, but at the same time, it doesn't mean that we should just observe with satisfaction. Situation is, we have also, this, probably not the same, but quite a significant number of new migrants arriving to our part of the world because of above mentioned reasons. We should meet also some challenges and uh, which these new tendencies are also uh, bringing before us. Okay, if there is no other question, then thank you very much for your presentation, for your talk. My, my big pleasure. Thank you. <laughs>